Something a bit different this week. We are live from the National Press Club with an audience. And at the start of this NAIDOC week, I'd like to pay my respects to the traditional custodians of this land and wherever you're watching. We're here in Canberra with this audience. Thank you all very much for coming along and sharing your Sunday morning with us. We're here to mark the arrival of insiders in the nation's capital. <laughs> It's great to be here. The, uh, the new Canberra studio is taking shape. Our team is working as hard as it can to have it ready for us from next week. In the meantime, we have some meaty issues to discuss this morning. Corruption in politics. The findings against Gladys Berejiklian come as the National Anti-Corruption Commission prepares to begin its work. What can we expect from this long-awaited body? The budget surplus, well, it's looking a lot bigger than it was only a couple of months ago. Why is that and will the government hold the line on new spending? And the, uh, the latest support package from Australia for Ukraine. It's been dismissed as a little too stingy by some. Our guest this morning is Ukraine's ambassador to Australia, Vasil Moroshnichenko. We'll see what he makes of this latest package and we'll discuss how the war is going and a rather extraordinary week in Russia. We have a terrific panel for you this morning too. Nikki Sava, Tom Crowley and Karen Middleton. Please make them welcome. <laughs> I'm David Spears. Welcome to Insiders. All right, Nikki Sava, Tom Crowley, Karen Middleton. Great to have you all here with us. Great to have a live audience with us as well. Let's dive right into it. Gladys Berejiklian. So she's been found by the New South Wales ICAC to, engage in, uh, to have engaged in serious corrupt conduct. Nikki, is it clear that she did? Well, according to the ICAC, um, it is, and there's no doubt at all that uh, she made a huge uh, political mistake and she's made, um, uh, paid a big price for that. And I don't think there's any doubt that, um, that she did the wrong thing and um, that she had to pay uh, for that. Just to explain uh, to viewers interstate, uh, who may not have followed what's happened, the finding is that she went out of her way to direct two government grants uh, to the electorate of her secret boyfriend, Daryl Maguire. Um, it, it kept all of that quiet, didn't tell ICAC when there were obvious suspicions about Daryl Maguire being corrupt. Didn't tell ICAC, but also didn't tell her uh, cabinet colleagues while the decisions were being made that they were in a secret relationship. Now, if she had come clean with that, if she had disclosed it to her colleagues and recused herself from any decision making, um, she would have been pretty much uh, in the clear over that. And I do believe that if she had done that, she would probably still be Premier today. Um, but yeah. she didn't do it. And that is what, in the end, brought her down. Yep. Now, she's not the first politician to have been brought down by a scheming lover and by bad judgment and she probably won't be the last. Nor is she the first Liberal Premier in New South Wales to run foul of ICAC. There was Barry O'Farrell, there was Nick Griner. She's the first though to be found to have engaged in serious corrupt conduct though, uh, Karen. That's, that's the difference here. Yeah, and it doesn't just say that she didn't disclose, she, it says she lied. She lied, she lied to the Commission, that's what it says, and, and, and that she lied to her Chief of Staff about the status of the relationship and that that was all about self-preservation. I, I think, you know, the difficulty here is people like Gladys, mm. they like her, mm. um, but, but we can't really afford, I don't think, to pick and choose when we're going to accept the findings of a Commission according to whether we like the person they've been looking at or well, not. Well, you say that, Karen. Uh, but you're right, she's still well liked, so much so that it seems every politician, yep. be they Labor or Liberal, are really reluctant yep. to repeat what ICAC has found. Ha have a look at some of the reaction to it. I'm not going to comment about specific recommendations or inquiries, just as I wouldn't, in the normal course of events, comment about Supreme Court judgments. I'd just say that it's open to the people who've been adversely named to pursue their own legal action in relation to those me measures. Everything I saw as a minister uh, from Gladys displayed the highest integrity. Uh, she worked 24-7. Everything I saw, uh, she behaved honestly, diligently. She's just a very decent person. Um, she chose uh, a bum, basically, and uh, he, he was a bad guy. And I think uh, that she has, you know, paid a big price for that. And uh, her, her integrity is not in question. She's not a corrupt person. Do you think Gladys Berejiklian is corrupt? 
that that's a matter that's been dealt with uh, in New South Wales, and uh, I, I note that it could be the subject of further uh, legal response as well. Her, Why are they treating? Her, her integrity is in question. And it's not about whether the guy was a dud boyfriend. A bum. You know, a bum. Nobody begrudges Gladys Berejiklian for having a relationship. You can understand why she wanted it to be private. You know, she didn't want the prying eyes of the public. She, she's got a conservative family. She's had a conservative upbringing. There may have been judgment about the manner in which she had her relationship. So she's kept it private. But when you're an elected public official holding an office like that, the activities and actions of your partner are important, they're significant, and what you do about them or don't do about them is important. And this is where she's gone wrong. She failed to act. She was obliged to act. She's made legally tricky arguments about it. She told the Commission that the Code of Conduct didn't apply to the Premier because it only mentions ministers. Mm. I mean, that's... You know, it's a bit tricky, Who right? Leaders were exempt from the. But, and we are conduct. we're seeing but a I different side people, to Gladys than we have seen before. Yeah. Well, people recognise, though, that um, voters in New South Wales still hold her in very high regard yep. for her exemplary yep. leadership over Black Summer fires, and um, also during and COVID. Both this also, is true. also, she has resigned. She is out of politics. And I don't think they want to be dancing on her grave. No, quite. I not. mean, she made a mistake, she paid the price. So what is the mileage now for another politician to be dancing on her that's grave? The, well, that's the policy. Yeah, and I think I mean I think the popularity is exactly one of the reasons why you need strong independent bodies to be able to make these judgments and not leave it to the politicians. I think the other frustrating thing about the politics that I've found in the last week has been a bit of a conflation about you know, I guess suggesting that ICAC's job should only be to, you know, kind of investigate crimes. And I think it's really important to emphasise that it's very important for these bodies to investigate corruption that is not criminal. So this is a really interesting point because the, the, the ICAC has said uh, that the DPP should consider criminal prosecution against Daryl Maguire, but hasn't said the same about Gladys Berejiklian. And some of her closest confidants have said, well, hang on, if it's not a criminal matter, what's the point of this? But th this, is, this is the very law that the ICAC operates under, isn't it? Mm. And it is the same law that the National Anti-Corruption Commission will operate under. There's criminal corruption, but there's also corruption that falls short of a criminal standard but still breaches public trust. Absolutely. And if it's only, you know, crimes that ICAC can look into, what's the point of ICAC? It's just a warm-up ban for, for the public prosecutors at that point. There's a much broader category of wrongdoing and breaches of public trust that we should be interested in from public officials. They act with our trust and I think it is, you know, a really important principle for a much broader variety of wrongdoing. I think there's a conversation to be had about whether serious corrupt conduct, which was the form of words that was used for both Berejiklian and Maguire, whether that suggests that we need, you know, to be able to distinguish degree a little better in the language that we use here. Maybe you need a score out of 10. Well, yeah, I mean, is, is there such a thing as unserious corrupt conduct, I suppose, is the question at that point, and why are we using the word serious? What exactly is it doing there? You know, the ability to distinguish degree is important, but equally important, I think, is the ability, whatever you want to call it, for ICAC to be able to investigate things like this and for all those bodies too, because it's quite clear. I mean, all of the things that we've heard, they may be personal and there may be some uncomfortable details, you know, to have been sort of brought out into public. But I think it's oh, very highly clear embarrassing. Yeah. Some of those phone call transcripts and so on. Absolutely, um, but in the public interest, clearly. And they left some of them out. Yeah. There was more, they said, that, that backed in the judgments they made. They've been judicious about what they included because they needed to support their findings. But they said to spare her further humiliation, they have left a lot of it out. Yeah, because she. But it is jarring isn't it, to have someone being accused of serious corruption and then to say, but they can't be prosecuted because it would never um, succeed in a court of law. So I think that's something that needs to be looked at. If you are going to accuse someone of something so serious, then they should have recourse to the courts as well, shouldn't they, to be able to say, but, um, well, see, it's get a ruling on... As I say, this is how the National Anti-Corruption Commission is going to work as well. They're not always just going to find criminal level corruption. Are, are you saying that it should be either all or nothing? No, I'm saying that, well, not all or nothing, but serious corruption, you would think, would lead to charges in a court of law, right? So there needs to be, I think, maybe a change in the language or a change in the law. One of the say other... that if there is that accusation, yeah. then it should go to a court and that would enable the person who's been accused 
to either be convicted or to clear themselves. There also needs to be a change to the Code of Conduct in New South Wales because there's a little clause in there that says that it's OK to, to funnel money to a colleague for their, to make them electorally popular, that that's not, a, that's not a private benefit. Well, I would have thought if you're the Premier and the colleague is a person in your party and funnelling money to them in order to make them electorally popular gets them elected, well, which keeps you as Premier, that's kind of a benefit. What did Gladys Berejiklian famously say about pork barrelling? We, Everybody do does it. it. Everybody does it, yeah. as if it was OK. Yeah. So the National Anti-Corruption Commission will be a little different in terms of public hearings, we know. Um, ICAC in New South Wales, there were like 30 days of public hearings for this case. The national body, it'll only be in exceptional circumstances that they have um, public hearings. That was long debated at the time. Does that mean we're going to see quite a different body, Tom, do you think, to, to the New South Wales version? It's going to be fascinating to see how exceptional circumstances sort of, you know, gets used. I think you could argue that this was an exceptional circumstance in the case of Gladys Berejiklian and that a federal NAC in a similar matter might have decided to go public. I think Victoria is another example on the other end of the spectrum where the rules around public hearings are much tighter. And as a result, we didn't know about an investigation into Daniel Andrews, which ultimately cleared him, you know, until IBAC published its, you know, finding of facts. So it'd be really interesting to see how the NAC sort of navigates this middle ground. I think the key thing will be swiftness. Yeah. Um, clearly, that's something that I think everyone agrees was a problem here. Long. It took, took way, way too long. long. Yeah. And it comes back to when you're talking about this kind of small c corruption, for want of a better term, and if you're not going to take something to a court, at the very least, if you're going to make that finding, the politician should have the option to then take that to the election. And I think that that's what Berejiklian was denied, was the opportunity to say, well, these are the findings, I'm not accused of any crime, let's go to another election and see what the voters think. I suspect they probably would have returned her. And the same thing with Andrews. So, you know, that, that swiftness is important. So the National Anti-Corruption Commission, it's now up and running and certainly plenty of referrals coming its way. That in-tray is, is starting to pile up, uh, you know, even before it begins its operation. Um, big question is whether Stuart Robert uh, will be looked at by the, uh, by the NAC, the National Anti-Corruption Commission. Uh, during the week, we saw quite an explosive uh, allegation, a submission that was made to a parliamentary committee that's now been made public. It's a submission from uh, Anthony Daly, who worked for this firm, Synergy 360, and whose ex-wife, uh, was one of the owners, one of the partners of Synergy 360. Take a look at part of the submission uh, where Anthony Daly says of the ownership structure of this, this uh, firm, the main objective of this arrangement was to secure Stuart Roberts' involvement and support in acquiring federal government contracts. Stuart Roberts' political influence and connections within the government sector were deemed crucial in ensuring favourable outcomes. Now, Stuart Robert flatly denies all of that. He says these are just wild allegations made under parliamentary privilege. But you'd have to think, Karen, um, the NAC, it's hard to imagine them not having a look at all of this. Well, indeed, and I'm sure there are people referring that matter to the NAC as we speak. In fact, I checked yesterday when they were uh, operating and they, they, they can take um, referrals online or on the phone, but the phone only operates during business hours on weekdays. Right. So apparently there was quite a lot of activity online yesterday, a bit of a jam, and well, maybe not as much as the Tay-Tay ticket situation, <laughs> but, but people were referring things as we understand it. I would be surprised if this was not referred by somebody yeah. to look at. Yeah. Yeah. But he, he, as you say, he's denying all these allegations. Yeah, what do you think, Nikki? How much trouble Stuart Robert in on this one? Uh, fairly deep, I would think, uh, based on what we know. And um, a lot of these allegations have been uh, made under privilege mm. and they've been going on for some time. He protests his innocence, but there's obviously um, a lot of material there that needs to be investigated and the NAC is the perfect uh, body to um, look at that and make a determination. So get, I think yeah, it's a Monty. They can get a lot more material than a parliamentary committee can. They have far greater powers. Bill Shorten, who's now the Minister, of course, for Government Services and the NDIS, um, he's a little reluctant to say whether he will refer Stuart Robert himself. Uh, he's getting some advice on this. In light of today's signed statement, which has been uploaded, I have immediately asked for uh, advice from my agency as to what are the most appropriate avenues to satisfactorily investigate this matter, and I wait their advice. Yeah, Labor's being pretty careful, as I understand it. They don't want to be seen to be making political referrals. Um, other parties, the Greens, have a long list of issues they're already referring. The, the Libs are referring the compensation payout to Brittany Higgins. But, um, but Labor, they're, they're just being a little bit cautious at the moment. 
Well, I mean, in this case, they don't need to, I suppose, is the first thing almost certainly. Someone else will refer it or the NAC doesn't really need a it referral. Need it might referral, just do it right? itself. And I think, actually, you know, it's a position that the government has arrived at a little belatedly, but it's a good position, and I think that it's one that all politicians should think about following. I'm just not sure that we want to get into the business of politicians, again, muddying the waters, because the NAC doesn't need referrals. A referral from Peter Dutton or David Shoebridge carries no more weight than a referral from you or me or anyone in this room. And I think it's unfortunate if we're going to get into a position where politicians of any stripe are putting out media releases sort of crying about having referred someone or other to the NAC, because yeah. that is just grandstanding. It doesn't make any difference good point. that a senator has done it. So I just think in terms of, you know, I think what the Berejiklian thing shows is how important it is to be able to rely on and trust these as an un unimpeachable authority. I don't think politicians should muddy those points. And it politicises an investigation before it's even started, if, it, if that's the way that it started. So I think that is a factor in this, in, in the hesitation. But also, the Prime Minister, in the context of the Brittany Higgins uh, debate that we've seen yeah, over the last couple of weeks and questioning about a compensation payment to her, he said politicians shouldn't be referring things to the NAC. So that sort of makes it a little bit difficult that when there's an, another situation where they might be inclined to yeah. do it, they, they're I'll bound by what, that. Though, when it comes to Stuart Robert, uh, I want to show you what Peter Dutton's saying because it's, it's a bit different to Gladys Berejiklian. See if you can spot the difference here. He's not calling Stuart Robert a wonderful person who's not corrupt. I think there'll be a number of matters that, uh, that get referred to uh, the Corruption Commission and I think that's appropriate. If there's evidence that people believe they have, uh, it should be referred for independent investigation. Uh, so we would uh, we'd support that process. Yeah, Nikki doesn't sound like a lot of love lost there. Very different relationship <laughs> there, I think, between the it's two like, um, boom, main heaven. parties. <laughs> but but I think Albanese is right. You know, if if the, if every political party starts referring their opponents, then it develops, um, you know, into a free for all, a tit for tat, and it has the potential to, um, I think, undermine the independence of the NAC. Now, the NAC will be perfectly capable of reading the newspapers, listening to Parliament and knowing exactly where it needs to go with its investigation. Yeah, and I think we're going to hear tomorrow's understand it on, on day one of the NAC from the Commissioner Paul Brereton, who might give a bit more um, guidance, I suppose, around his approach to the role and what the Commission will be doing. We look forward to that. Uh, all right, we'll come back to the panel shortly. Time to turn to Australia's latest support package for Ukraine, $110 million worth of military and humanitarian aid. Before we... Ambassador Vasil Morosnichenko, welcome. Great to have you with us uh, here for this uh, live audience uh, program as well. Look, we just saw some of the debate this week around this latest support package. Let's start there. Are you really happy with this latest support from Australia? Look, I want to share with you a story of last week uh, in Kramatorsk. Uh, Russians sent uh, a ballistic missile which destroyed a popular restaurant. It was a pizza place. It uh, killed 12 people, injured 65. Uh, among those who were killed were three children. Two of those children were twins, 14-year-old uh, girls. And uh, their mother was looking for wedding dresses to bury them. Because in Ukraine we have a tradition of burying young girls in a wedding dress because they never get married. Mm. Can you imagine what we have to live through on a daily basis? That's what every Ukrainian waking up reads. This is what kind of news we get. Look, definitely we are incredibly grateful to Australia for the support provided, for the latest package of support. And it goes in line of the, of the support that's been provided by this government and the previous government. Of course, we need to ensure that the war does not last for long as it takes, but rather that it ends as quickly as possible because the longer it drags on, it brings more death, more destruction, more misery. So to that end, is what Australia is offering enough support right now? Look, we appreciate what's, what's coming. And uh, I personally would like to thank Prime Minister Anthony Albanese for travelling to Ukraine last year. He could see it with his own eyes, uh, what, what Russians have done in Ukraine. Good, there is a continuous dialogue between our ministers of defence. They've recently met in Singapore. Mm. It would be wonderful to have Minister Penny Wong visit Kyiv. Uh, I'm in constant contact with the Defence Department and the Defence Minister's office and seeing what else could be done to help Ukraine. So you're inviting the Foreign Minister Penny Wong to, to come to Kyiv? 
Absolutely. I mean, our foreign, foreign minister would be delighted to see her. Do you think that might change Australia's view and attitude? That would help um, her uh, to understand Ukraine better. You don't think she does? I think she does understand Ukraine very well, but it always, when you visit, it gives you a different um, angle. It gives you a bit, a bit of hands-on, and, and that gives you, I mean, I've seen it with your prime minister. I was there on that trip, and we were in Irpin, we were in Bucha. We were able to hear those uh, stories which, which, which were out there shared with people being under the Russian occupation. And I think that's, that's, that's a good opportunity to... But why are you mentioning Penny Wong particularly? Are you suggesting she's not as... Uh, perhaps more focused on this region than, than Ukraine? Look, um, the Russian aggression in Ukraine has undermined global security. It's an issue which has affected everybody. It has undermined security in the, in the Pacific. We are seeing what's happening with, with food crisis, with energy crisis, how many countries become exposed and vulnerable to these shocks. And of course, we have to deal with that. Ukraine is, is one of the biggest providers of food on the global markets. And we were not able to deliver that food to the countries in need in Africa and Southeast Asia who suffered because of that. You talk about the energy shock uh, as, as part of this, and that's pushed up commodity prices. It's helped uh, commodity resource exporters like Australia. We see our budget, we're going to talk about this shortly, our budget surplus is looking a whole lot bigger as a result. Looking at that, do you think Australia is being generous enough? Many of our partners have inadvertently benefited from the increased prices for commodities. And uh, of course, this is all the result of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. But countries like Canada, Norway, Australia, the increased prices for commodities have really done well for their budgets and the surplus of budgets. And we see how these countries are stepping up their support. Just earlier this year, Norway has committed a multi-billion, multi-year program of support for Ukraine. The same in Canada, and I think there are many opportunities. Multi-billion, you're saying? Multi yeah, multi-billion dollar uh, uh, assistance, both economic assistance, military assistance, and it's coming. Look, uh, we, we are you know, incredibly grateful for whatever we get, for every uh, dollar, for yeah. every round of ammunition, for every Bushmaster. We're extremely grateful for that. But are you saying because we're benefiting in a budget sense from those high commodity prices, because of what's happened there, Australia has a moral obligation to do more than it's doing? Look, I just got back from Kiev. I was there three weeks ago. And um, you, you just, I mean, the, 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 every day Kiev is under attacks. Mm. And uh, kids who play out on the play playground, and then you see them running into shelters when there is a siren. Because you never know when it's going to hit. This is what we have to go through every day, being traumatized, being, being out there. And the support we get from our partners, this is the resilience of that international coalition, if this is what is important. Because only together, when we are stronger together, because look, if Australia were invaded or at war, we'll be out there for you to help you. Mm. More so, there are so many lessons which could be learned from this war. But just, to, would... just to pick up on your point, though, about countries like Australia that are benefiting in a budget sense from the war, are you saying they have a particular obligation to do more? Look, it's up to the government to decide what else they can do for Ukraine. Apparently, as an ambassador here, I would be delighted if there would be more support coming. And we d definitely thankful for what's been provided so far. And well, let's, let's go through some of the, some of the items. Um, the Hawkeyes. Ukraine ran a very public and prominent social media campaign, Free the Hawkeyes. You even had your Eurovision finalists join in on the campaign as well. Uh, you, you've not got one Hawkeye, though. Um, Will you keep up that campaign? Are you disappointed not to get any? Look, this, um, the Hawkeyes already have a life on its own. It's something that, that it was just captured the imagination of the people. Why is that? I think this is just unique because this is a new piece of equipment which has been produced, or 1,100 of those. We see how Hawkeyes could be rolled out for different missions. They could be used for reconnaissance. They could be used for electronic warfare. Once integrated with air defense systems, they could be very handy air defense systems. And as you see, Russians are sending so many missiles at Ukraine, so air defense systems are in high need. But apparently the brakes are no good, the parts can't be supplied, so if there is a problem, they could be shot to pieces very quickly on the battlefield. That's, that's the argument. Look, Ukraine is the best testing ground. Where else can you test your military kit? 
it could be tested in Ukraine, it could be improved, and this is what's going to increase the capability of your defense forces. So that's been tested, and this is, by the way, many different defense industry companies throughout the world are testing their equipment in Ukraine now. We make it better, we make your defenses much stronger, and that's a great contribution to help Ukraine. But look at the Bushmasters. They've been become a symbol of Australian support. 90 of those been committed. They are saving lives. They're getting wounded people from the front lines. And that's a huge contribution that you've made. And sending more Bushmasters would really be very helpful. So more Bushmasters beyond the, the 90. There is a concern here about running down Australia's capability as well. Do you, do you appreciate that? Or do you think there should be more going? I think Bushmasters never had so much publicity as they got out of this war. <laughs> That's probably true. And uh, I know that the many countries are now looking into actually commissioning your Bendigo facility to produce more. So I think that will create more jobs, that will keep that facility going, more taxes for the government, mm -hmm. and actually uh, it's the right thing to do. Just and on that, would you prefer countries like Australia to give Ukraine money and then you can choose what you want to buy? It might be Bushmasters rather than giving you stock that we're you know, soon going to be getting rid of anyway? Oh, different options are possible. And previously, uh, Australia procured and actually allocated money for the purchase of weapons for Ukraine. Is that, better? Is that a better option? Look, it's just one of the options which is out there, because often I hear the argument that, that you know, because different countries have different mm. capabilities, whatever they have in stock. You're being so, very diplomatic here, uh, Ambassador, as we would expect. It's my job. Uh, exactly. Um, <laughs> The uh, M113 armoured vehicles, there's 28 of those coming your way as well. Look, these have been variously described as Vietnam War relics, obsolete boneyard vehicles, unwanted garage sale stock. How would you describe them? I've never ridden one. <laughs> right. So it's difficult for me to assess um, the feedback that, that was out there. I know we have a fleet of 300 of those and they will be made, uh, and they've been used, and of course, especially when we're gonna go into the winter, starting from October, because they're on tracks, so they could still be employed and they, they could be quite so handy. So they're, they're going to be useful? Yeah, they're gonna be useful. Um, the so th those who say, but those let me just compare with yeah. Bushmasters. So Bushmasters, because of their design, they have this additional protection from the bottom, because so of their V-shaped shape. bottom. Right, so, and whereas, from what I understand, the M113s don't have that protection. If they hit a mine, you can get, most likely you will get killed if you're inside, right? So Bushmasters perform much better, they're much faster, but this, you know, two vehicles are used in different times of seasons, right? So, so those who are saying these M113s are junk, they're look, wrong. No, I, I don't know. I'm not a military expert to comment on that. I know that they will be used and they will be useful. And, and, yep, okay. and of course, look, uh, it, it's just... Uh, Would uh, you like the M1 Abrams tanks? We've got a bunch of those, uh, 59, they're due to be phased out of service next year. Would you like those? Well, that would make global headlines if Australia joined uh, the tank coalition. As you remember, for a long time we were campaigning, Ukraine was campaigning for a tank coalition, and Germany has released the Leopard tanks. It was huge. We already will be seeing how those Leopard tanks and brigades have been used right now to repel the Russians from Ukraine, to restore the sovereignty. I think any support for Ukraine will be a very good investment into the restoration of the rules-based international system. Well, the Something which is so important for every Pacific nation. Mm -hmm. Because if you can allow a bigger power to curse a smaller power militarily, that's a, and, and you don't fight back and you let that happen, that sends a very wrong signal, especially to your neighbors, to countries who depend so much on your support to be sovereign and to make their own decisions and not to be influenced by bigger powers. The Prime Minister will be at the NATO summit in Lithuania in about 10 days' time. Um, I understand he might have a bit more to offer. Are you expecting any more from Australia from the Prime Minister's visit? We would definitely welcome more support. And uh, should the government decide to do it, I'm sure President Zelensky will be very thankful. Let me turn to what's been going on in Russia over the past week. Um, a lot of head scratching now about where it leaves Putin, um, Prigozhin, uh, the, the, the Russian state. What do you think is going to happen from here? I don't think we have to be captured by this palace intrigue and the power in Russia. Mm. What we have seen, we haven't seen any major impact in the battlefield as the mutiny was unfolding. Russians kept on shelling Ukrainian cities, sending missiles, heavy battlefields on the, on, the, on the front lines. Definitely the reputation of Vladimir Putin was dented, his leadership was challenged. And in a country like Russia, it's really extraordinary to see it happening. 
You understand, Russia is running and Putin is running the country as a thug. So it's pretty much a, a gangster country and all these thugs and somebody revolts all of a sudden. I mean, are you this worried? Is, this is already kind of very yeah. bizarre, right? If he, if he got toppled, is there a fear that you could get something even worse? I don't think anything can be worse, right? I, I mean, can it get any worse? Look, Russians have deployed 150,000 people in, in Ukraine, occupy 20% of the land. They just shell us on a continuous basis, killing, raping, and murdering people. Can it get any worse? I don't think so. It's already pretty bad. But I think that the change of the regime, if we can win the war on the battlefield and can defeat Russian troops on the ground, that will precipitate the demise of this dictatorial regime, which has stolen future from the Russian people, which has stolen what's the legacy that Putin is going to leave. People are, you know, pariah state, failed state, toxic. Nobody wants to deal with Russia. What kind of legacy is he leaving to the Russian people? Let's save Russian people. Let's give them hope for democracy. The only way to do it is provide more military assistance to Ukraine. Ambassador, finally, before I let you go, I think a lot of Australians have great sympathy for what's happening uh, to the Ukrainian people, but perhaps not the, the, the personal understanding of, of what it really means. You were just there um, two or three weeks ago. Can you give us a sense of what it means for, for your family, your friends, for those who are really experiencing this firsthand? It's devastating. I think one of the issues as we move on will be mental health. Ukrainian population of 44 million people are heavily traumatized by what they see, what they read. It's live. It's on your Google. You go there. It's on your phone. You can see it real. Of course, it's not a show, right? It's live. And every day there are more and more funerals of people, people you knew, people who's been somebody's friends or relatives. And, and this is what we live through. It's extremely difficult. And I spent three weeks in Ukraine now in May and June. And, and seeing that is really heartbreaking. And, and it's only a daily basis for 60 months as Russians keep on destroying our infrastructure. I was just there when they deliberately destroyed Kaholka uh, Dam, which has flooded large parts of Ukraine, creating one of the biggest man-made environmental disasters. We hear that they have mined the nuclear power plant and they may use nuclear as a blackmail. Radiation does not know borders. The contamination which can happen would be devastating for entire Europe. We need to stop it. Well, Ambassador, we do appreciate you uh, sharing all of that with us this morning. Would you please thank Vassil Moroshenchenko? Thank you. Well, back to the panel in a moment. Uh, first, here were some of the arguments around how Australia is actually funding this latest support package for Ukraine. In essence, Defence is covering the cost of this. Um, there is a, an active deployment, which is Operation Kudu, which is the Australians who are in Britain right now engaged in the training of the Ukrainian armed forces. That's uh, the funding of that is occurring in the normal way that operations uh, are funded. Uh, but the funding for this package is being covered by Defence. I think the Prime Minister should reassess the commitment that he's made. And I think the Defence Minister should put a better argument around the cabinet table to get fresh money for defence. They took a billion and a half dollars out of defence in the most recent budget and they're saying to defence that they need to pay for the equipment that's being sent to Ukraine. It's a complete nonsense. Uh, defence should be getting new money to provide support uh, to our friends in Ukraine. If we do that, we can save lives and we can help Ukraine achieve a successful outcome. All right, we've shuffled the panel back into place. Uh, Karen, this whole argument around the latest support package has been uh, really interesting to watch. What do you think? Was it uh, a little on the, on the short side? Was it too stingy? Well, I think you're right that the Prime Minister's probably going to um, make another announcement at the NATO summit and wanted to hold something back to do that. So there is that. Um, the Ambassador's right when he talks about the Bushmaster vehicles. I travelled in them in Afghanistan. They're incredible. Yeah, I spent about a week in one of them in Afghanistan. Yeah. Uh, so you, not, perhaps not the most comfortable ride, but they're, um, no, you feel safe. No, they are incredible. I think that there is concern within defence and within government that Australia can't leave itself short by just constantly sending Bushmasters. So there's that. Yeah. going on. The issue with the Hawkeyes, with the greatest of respect to the Ambassador, you know, you can't send a vehicle whose brakes don't work 
um, off, off to the war. Uh, the situation... Can't make it a testing ground, though. No, because um, the problem with the brakes is, is that they work fine at low speed, but when they get to high speed, they don't work. Now, it's been said from people in, um, in Ukraine, look, we'll, we want to use them off-road, we don't want to use them on highways, it's OK. But, you know, you can't tell the occupants of that vehicle when someone is firing on them, you can't drive over 40 k's an hour to get away. Sorry. You can't. And you can imagine what would happen the first time that Ukrainian soldiers died in a vehicle like that because the brakes failed. So you can't, you can't do it. And the issue with aircraft is, as I understand it, the Americans are donating, I think it's F-16 yeah. fighter jets. The Australian government doesn't want to donate different aircraft and the general view among the Allied supporters... Plus it's it, up to the Americans largely, isn't it? Because it's their technology on the F-18. But also there's a practical thing. You have to train pilots on a different aircraft. You, you want the pilots all to be trained on the one aircraft, not on a range of different for an aircraft. That just complicates the problem. So there are sort of practical reasons yeah. why these decisions have been taken, as, as well as the concern about Australia's own... Yeah, and look, the, a lot of these are sort of technical arguments around each bit of kit and why you can or can't give, give this or that. What's clear listening to the Ambassador, Tom, is that Ukraine really needs more support. Um, you know, this, this war ain't over, uh, you know, despite perhaps some excitement around what might be happening around, you know, internally in Russia. This fight is still ongoing and it, it matters to the world. Absolutely, and I think you know. I think the, the events of the last week or two have certainly boosted the prominence of it here in Australia. Again, we're talking about it a lot more. I think it does reflect just the, the difficulty that the government faces on a number of fronts with a number of pressing priorities. I think that this surplus that they've got is starting to look almost more like a, a curse than a blessing. They know that it's a sort of a one-off thing, and they don't we'll want to we'll make to too that. much yeah. of it. But you know, it, when the opposition goes at them on this and on so many other things, it does make it harder when you're saying no. You do look stingy. Well, and it is interesting the ambassador pointing out to Nikki that um, countries like Australia, Canada, Norway, we're benefiting from these higher commodity prices enormously. That's why, well, one of the reasons why the budget surplus is looking better. Do we have an obligation to spend more than others uh, helping Ukraine as a result? Well, that is the clear implication, um, isn't it, that uh, came from that interview. Um, well, the fact is that we have given um, a lot of aid and compared to um, other countries, you know, we rate uh, very highly. But also, it doesn't mean that we've reached the end of our aid program um, to the Ukraine. And as Karen said before, the Prime Minister will probably announce more when he's in Lithuania for um, NATO. So it's not like, you know, we've finished. There's still an ongoing program of assistance and, and will be that, until, well, politic... until it's over. But the other point really to make is that no matter how much we give, it's never going to be enough. Mm. And that is understandable. And the politics of holding something back could be tricky for the government too, if it looks like they've, they've only not made the announcement, so they've got something to say in Lithuania. That, announceable. That's a bit, yeah, that's a bit but not what about great, the yeah. politics of supporting Ukraine? I mean, there was a Lowy Institute poll, I think, a week ago, still had very strong support. It had come off a bit, but I think it was still 76% of Australians saying, yes, they support providing uh, help to, to Ukraine. Look, I, I guess people are going to say that to a pollster. There is a bit of a view that in a cost of living crisis there are limits to how much Australians want to keep sending uh, financially to, uh, to Ukraine. But you look at those numbers, it's still pretty solid. I think there's a view in the government that, that they think people in a situation like this where there's a you know, pressure on the economy at home will make a judgement that they don't want too much going yeah. offshore, even if it is in such a good cause. So their mind, they're juggling the, the domestic, the sense of the domestic sentiment as well. Yeah. Gee, Peter Dutton went pretty hard in the libs on, on this announcement during the week. I thought that was, that was really interesting because it's been so bipartisan that really ripping in that this is not enough. Let's talk about the budget. Um, the, uh, you know, the, the demands to spend more, no doubt, will be, uh, will be rising after what we're now looking at. It was forecast to be $4.2 billion. We're talking about the financial year that's just finished. Um, that was the forecast in May. Now uh, it's looking like $19 billion plus, uh, so, you know, five times. W why, Tom? Uh, well, you know, good old commodities again. Um, they've saved the day for plenty of um, treasurers in the last kind of 10 or 20 years, and it looks like 
I suppose they're going to save the day again. Although, as I say, I think politically it's almost more of a curse than a blessing because it doesn't fix the structural imbalance that the budget has and the government wants to be very careful, careful about the inflation story, careful not to make that problem worse just, just as it looks like inflation's turning the corner. So I don't think they want to have more pressure on them to spend more at the moment, um, but I think it's going to come now. Well, it, yeah, because, I mean, household budgets are absolutely still being squeezed and the Prime Minister was asked yesterday, how do you think families are going to feel about you sitting on a, a much, much bigger uh, federal budget surplus? Here he was. I believe that Australian families will look at the federal budget and say it is good that we have a government that is putting in place responsible budget management in order to put that downward pressure on inflation. Nikki, do you reckon that's how Australian families will look at this? Mm, maybe, but <laughs> probably not. Um, I think it is going to be a very hard sell for the government um, to say, yeah, well, great, we've got a $19 billion surplus, but we're not going to give it out to um, help relieve cost of living pressures. But obviously, if they were to do that, it would only um, increase the problem. You'd only see higher inflation and higher interest rates. So This is the tough part of... Um budget management, isn't it? Not spending money, uh, making that call, how much to spend that's not going to push up inflation in a situation like this. And whether people are, under, are able to understand that and, and to accept it, that there is going to be, you know, short term pain, hopefully for longer term gains. So if they can get through this um, period, I think then, you know, then probably next year there will be benefits. But just got to get through this. You could accept term. it intellectually, but when you can't pay the rent and put food on the table, it becomes harder to accept, doesn't it? Even if it's sensible and yeah. economically reasonable. It sounds like they're going to hold the line, though, Tom. Well, it does, but I mean, I think it's also important to point out that it's not, you know, spending isn't the only lever that they've got. And I think that, um, yes, you know, there are very many households who are doing it tough at the moment, but that is a more complicated story in the sense that, you know, we almost have a bit of a two speed consumer economy at the moment because overall household wealth has gone up since the RBA started increasing interest rates. There are some households mm. who built up a whole lot of savings during the pandemic. They've got a whole lot of wealth. People who own their houses without mortgages who aren't really being touched by interest rate rises and they are spending and spending like it's going out of fashion. They did so in the end of financial year sales. People are about to get some money back in their tax returns. There are some people in the economy who are still driving discretionary spending and that's a big part of the well, continuing the, yeah, inflation. I mean, the, the retail figures the other day were still going up, people spending more. Absolutely. We did, however, see inflation come off more than expected. It's a monthly figure, so, you know, it's a bit yeah. more volatile. But it really dropped, it didn't, 6.8 down to 5.6. How significant was that? Yeah, so I think I mean, when you strip out sort of food and electricity, which are the most sort of, or petrol, the most volatile components of that, it's a much sort of smaller tailing off. We are, we, it does seem that we're starting to turn the corner, and for that to be happening when unemployment's barely moved and remains really low, that's a great result. This is the, this is the thing, to have, to have a budget surplus that's growing, inflation coming down and still a pretty strong jobs market. Look, no one's going to be cheering at the moment because inflation well, no, is still but, way I mean, too that, high. That's but, right. yeah. The economists tell us, though, that it takes 12 months for an, a Reserve Bank decision to filter through on interest rates, to filter through. Now, that means we're really only just starting to see the impact of those early rate decisions from last year. So what does that tell us about where the trajectory we're on uh, if if we're starting to see this from a year ago and there are like 10 more since then. So I think people are getting a little bit nervous about where the economy could be headed and that will be putting pressure on the reserve when it meets to make the next decision. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's true, but I, yeah, the interest rate still does remain, you know, I mean, I suppose mortgage rates, they've gone up by a lot. They haven't gone up by as much as inflation. So, you know, in real terms, Savers, you know, like me, a renter who's trying to buy a house, my savings, the real value of those have eroded, um, even though it's been sitting in the bank account for the last year or so. So it, it, it is, I think, still a complicated picture. But aren't you happy the federal budget's looking uh, so much better? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, but, and, and that's, but that's where I come back to the revenue side of the budget, where if you've got a group of people, you know, I mean, ordinarily, if housing values had fallen because of the Reserve Bank's rate rises, then some of those wealthier people might have had that wealth effect where their property values go down. That hasn't happened. So if, if, if that's the group that we need to stop spending, are there tax levers the government could be yeah. pulling at this point? Now, look, uh, July 1 yesterday, the government spent all week spruiking all the things that kick in from July 1, including the higher childcare subsidies, and that meant uh, a lot of politicians visiting childcare centres, something we always love to see. The higher pro electricity prices as well? Yes, but just on childcare, the PM was at a childcare centre in Melbourne. Uh, he decided to, as they do, start reading some books to the kiddies. Uh, he was reading one on 
rocket ships, which was an interesting choice given the day before they'd axed a program to, to build Australian satellites. But, but as he read that book, one of the toddlers had a, better, uh, had a better book option. Have a look. Rockets have power. They rise and roar. This rocket's waiting, ready to soar. Oh no, oh no. Smelly Bill sticks again. <laughs> Smelly Bill stinks again, Jed Carney's face <laughs> said it all. Uh, all right, uh, we, just before we go to talking pictures, the Fadden by-election uh, on the Gold Coast about two weeks away now. Nikki, what's at stake and what's expected? Well, I don't think people really expect any great movement. Um, Dutton actually needs to get a swing against uh, the government. A swing to him, yeah. Um, a swing to him. Um, but I don't think that that's uh, going to happen. And Labor is uh, not expecting anything other than maybe a small swing um, against it. So, really, I think it's going to be a status quo um, election. But even if there was to be a huge swing against the LNP in that seat, in the overall scheme of things, I don't think it would mean very much for Dutton. It's not going to change his behaviour, it's not going to change his tactics. They'll factor that in and they'll put everything on destroying the voice and hoping that the um, economy slips into recession and that's what will save him. But Just the government yeah. will try and shape that home to him. They'll say that it's Peter Dutton that is the reason if there is a swing against him. Well, of course. That's what he'll but, have to manage. But what is it going to mean? Absolutely Just nothing politicking. for the LNP yeah. politicking, but it's not going to change a single tactic. It's not going to lead to a move against uh, that might be what they're worried about. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps. Well, they want to save Dutton, don't they? <laughs> All right, our panel, Nikki Sabber, Tom Crowley and Karen Middleton, will be back very shortly with some final observations. Time now, though, for Mike Bowers and Talking Pictures. I'm Mike Bowers and I'm photographer at large for The Guardian Australia. I'm talking pictures this morning from the School of Cybernetics at the Australian National University, the one only Andrew Mears, and a very warm welcome back. Thanks so much, Mike. Just let me check what's going on here. Yeah. I'm just, what, what, what's going on? I'm trying to get some Tay-Tay tickets, of course. Oh, stressful. I'm only 36,000s in the queue, so I'm, I'm hopeful of getting one at might some be, point. Might be beyond your wildest dreams, Mike. <laughs> Andrew, I did love this, David Pope. Meanwhile, in the Treasury's emergency situation room, no one is refreshing their browser window. And uh, it looks to me like we've got a Taylor Swift bluey lead recovery here. Yeah, we've got a new terms of trade. New terms of trade, the bluey index, <laughs> the Taylor index. <laughs> Andrew, a lot of Australians have a problem with online gambling, but in your inquiry gets its recommendations up, they might not have a problem with the advertising anymore. How do you think? What are the chances, do you reckon? What are the odds? Uh, is it un-Australian to say I don't understand what a same-day multi is? <laughs> What even is that? I'm glad you said that because I don't either. <laughs> Lovely Matt Golding, the online betting sites have terrible odds on you getting Swifty tickets. Yeah, how are we going? Uh, 34,000 still. Oh, God, it's me. <laughs> Hi. I'm the problem, it's me. Lovely Andrew Dyson, gambling ads to go, bet now. Part of that Australian thing, we'd bet on anything. I was, I was looking for the two flies crawling up a wall. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew, the government were, was on the defensive about its military assistance to Ukraine. Like, I don't think there's any problem in giving us some surplus stuff, even if it was from the Vietnam War era. I don't know if you remember, but David Rose picked... He certainly remembered. I yeah. think we've got Wayne and Arthur. Yeah. The Dodgy Brothers! What's crazy, crazy, crazy! <laughs> remember them? I do. Fast forward. Yeah. Um, maybe we should throw these in for free! <laughs> Um, Dodgy Brothers, Dick and Tones, we'll throw in the hubcaps. Gratis. Yeah, as, uh, as their sort of, I don't need a ride, uh, says the, um, the, the president of, of Ukraine. Sadly, we lost uh, one of the giants of the, the Labor movement in Simon Crean this week, which was very unexpected. He was always a real gentleman to deal with, I found, Simon. Yeah, and it's always heartbreaking when all those beautiful things are said yeah. and the commentary around here how right he was on Iraq yeah yeah and he wasn't here to hear it yeah yeah Simon Cream was a man of principle whose opposition to the war in Iraq was proved right in hindsight that's a bit of AUKUS yeah that's a beautiful pun there Kathy Wilcox yeah. Andrew 
Is Putin on the fritz or are we rushing to the conclusions? Um, what is going on over there? Prigozhin. He's the former chef, Putin's chef, and uh, Brett Lethbridge has picked up on that. Um, he's got him slowly turning over the Ukraine fire and uh, seasoning him liberally here. You're done. Yeah, I think all that's missing there is the hot mustard. Yeah, yeah. Lovely Spooner, the fog of Wagner, as, uh, as he's sort of driving his tank and, uh, and out comes the coup. A little coup. Lindsay Foyle's done this really quite sharp cartoon. There are unconfirmed reports coming out of Belarus of the unexpected death of Yegeny Prigozhin next month. He surely would be nervous, yeah? Yeah, this reminds me of how the media operates on causes in the future. Yeah. Because it's their role, to yeah, tell yeah. us what's going to happen. And, yeah. well, this cartoon is yeah. perhaps letting us know. Well, the National Anti-Corruption Commission kicks off very shortly, but uh, the New South Wales version, the um, ICAC, came up with some pretty strong findings against former New South Wales Premier Gladys Berejiklian. Yeah, they certainly had corruption in their sights. Yep. It's um, a beautiful uh, Cadelga cartoon, the Wagga Wagga Gladys Berejiklian and Clay Target Shooting Championship. Paul, <laughs> we're very disappointed in you two years later. Um, Fiona Kataskis has thrown forward to the uh, National Anti-Corruption Commission, the NAC, and she seems to think there'll be a lot of uh, quite nervous federal politicians up there. As well as special powers, we've got an expanded public gallery and a jumbo-sized popcorn machine. Well, it's been a great pleasure, Andrew. How are we going here? 32,000. God. Oh, it looks like a glitch. Yeah, yep. We'll just have to shake it off. I'll let you do the honours. Over to you, David! That's uh, downstairs in the press club. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Mirzi and uh, Mike Powers as well. Uh, now, also, just on Simon Crean, just wanted to note that uh, as well. Many have pointed out the, the courage that he showed on the Iraq war and also internal reform of the ALP as well. As someone who interviewed him many times, uh, high respect for him. He was someone who respected the process, didn't mind a tough interview. Uh, always a pleasure to deal with someone who wanted to explain his position at all points. So uh, my thoughts with Simon Crean's family. Let's get some final observations. Karen. Indeed, I support that too, David. Uh, the National Disability Insurance Scheme is 10 years old. Its legislation allows for it to provide services that are reasonable and appropriate. Now, that's a broad definition. There's a review underway that's already flagging that definition should tighten. That's that's leading the way to restricting access to some support services. It'd be tricky for the government to manage. They say that they'll get state services to pick up the slack so people won't miss out, but that's going to be complicated for them. Interestingly, this weekend, the former Human Services Minister, Linda Reynolds, is saying she thinks there should be a co-payment, that people with disabilities should pay something towards those services. It's not clear whether that's just her view or the opposition position. Be interesting to watch. Yes, and ask some questions uh, on that, Tom. Yeah. Um, got a brief mention in talking pictures. I think that the um, the gambling committee and its recommendations this week were very strong um, and bipartisan, which was interesting to note. It's a well-resourced lobbying group that uh, in, in that industry, so I think that to recommend a total ban on advertising and multis and, you know, early payouts and all the rest, as a young sports-loving male, I've seen a lot of friends lose a lot of money to this, and so I think it's good to see some action. Yeah, indeed. Nikki? Uh, New South Wales federal Liberals, <coughs> excuse me, are going to be opening their pre-selections for federal seats tomorrow. All eight seats uh, that they hold except one, and that is the seat of Cook, mm. because they're hoping that Scott Morrison will um, resign um, fairly soon to take up a job. Strangely enough, people are not queuing up to offer him one, so he could be there for some time. We'll see. Uh, thank you all very much. Finally, uh, I would like to thank both our panellists and everyone here in the audience for coming along, being so well behaved this morning uh, as well, and remaining seated until the end of the program. But should we ever manage to convince the US President to come on the show, well, he can do whatever he likes at the end of the interview. We'll leave you with that. Thanks for watching. <laughs> I said president. I'd be a president for every American, whether they voted for me or not. Well, and, and the ones that didn't vote for your bills, but run on them. That's, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Mr. President, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very oh, much. I appreciate it's great to have you. It's thank you. To thank have you. you. Thank, thank you. you. You're making us all feel very excited about being here.